Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for our wonderful hosts and the volunteers making this possible. Uh, it's really sweet to be with you all. It's been a while because of the holiday and <clears throat> Chandra and I sometimes go back and forth and uh, give each other um, an evening where we aren't in this kind of practice, doing our own practice. So yeah, I was really looking forward to being together this evening. I know that last week you all looked at karma and I guess solved all of that. So that's wonderful. Now that we've moved on from karma, we can go ahead and give up all the causes of suffering. So that's uh, the topic for our chapter tonight. And in that we're really looking at renunciation. And we, we talked about this as well when we were covering the Lojong slogans that we were reading about the last nine months. And I think it's, it's, it's very easy to feel a sense of uncertainty and, and maybe even dislike for this idea of renunciation. The word has a really heavy charge to it in our contemporary culture. It seems like something is going to be asked of us that is going to be uncomfortable, that's going to require us to give up what we enjoy and what matters. So I'm really excited for us to delve into a deeper understanding of renunciation through these beautiful selected quotes. Um, for those of you who may be coming here for the first time tonight, welcome. This is the Well of Being, and we are, we are working with this text. So this is On the Path to Enlightenment, and it's a collection of core teachings by Matthew Ricard, who's a scholar and a monk and a uh, I would, I, I, would, I would say he's a bodhisattva. Uh, he really dedicates his life to service. And he has organized just these beautiful selection of inspiring texts to him on the quintessential teachings. So that's, that's where we are. And this evening we'll start off with a meditation as we normally do. And then we will look at this text this evening, especially, Mathieu is bringing forth such an interesting tradition in these teachings, especially in Tibetan Buddhism, of recounting teachings as poems. And recounting teachings as almost these kind of, um, these aspirational prayers that are said out loud. And there's a couple of those that we might look at this evening as well and kind of get the flavor of <clears throat> what are these heartfelt prayers around renunciation? What is the goal? What are they trying to instruct us? So I, I think it's going to be a rich evening and I look forward to discussion and questions as well. And yeah, just a reminder that the San Francisco Dharma Collective is a completely volunteer run organization. So this is one where we really value each of you who are attending tonight. You are part of our collective. And it really matters to us to have a collective where we are working, of course, on our own material, trying to wake up and liberate ourselves from destructive habits and emotions, and that we're doing so for the sake of all beings. So when we come together and, and do that as community, it's of utmost importance to really hold each other in, in reverence, to hold the space and time together in reverence. So I invite you in uh, the course of this evening, if you are listening and engaging with others to do so with compassion. Hear what others are saying and really take it in with this compassionate listening. And as you're speaking, engage in that same way, compassionate speech, considering what you're offering and hoping and aspiring for it to be of benefit and for it to be at the very least non-harming. So that's our collective intentions and aspirations here to really hold each other with that goal of how can we, of course, uh, start working our hearts and minds further for the benefit of all beings and doing so in a way that's caring and considerate to one another. So with that, I will invite you to find a posture that will support you for our practice. It can be very helpful to invite an upright spine. For many of us, there's a lot of sitting these days, if we are doing work remotely. So see if there's a different way you can hold your seated posture. Maybe you're in the same seat or in the same room, but what can you do to signal to your body that this is actually a different posture? This is one of 
really deeply going inward. And if it feels comfortable, you can kind of dim out your screen so that you know that you're here and present with one another, but not being pulled into the screen for the course of practice or position it kind of sideways. So really take time to find the posture with your gaze and also with your body. That is one of practice. Well, it's definitely cheaper to buy the blueberries. No problem. Just a reminder that we should mute ourselves or you will be muted, no problem. And before we begin, let's just take a minute to really take in the space around us. For many of us, it's a very familiar room, but we can still allow our gaze and head to look to the left. It's kind of taking in our space around us and gazing to the other side, gazing above and gazing into our own lap. And if it's comfortable, gently closing the eyes, having this sense of real place and presence. Invite a softness, a gentleness through the belly. If you have any constricting clothes, maybe loosen them so that your breath can flow completely unencumbered through the belly. Find a placement for your hands that allows your shoulders to not feel strained. So that could be kind of cupped together in your lap or laying flatly on your thighs. Feel or imagine the slightest upward tilt of the chest. As though the heart is open and receiving upwards. And invite a softening, a relaxing through the face. Spend a moment or two here, continuing to notice and connect with sensations through the face. With gentle curiosity, start exploring areas of sensation, maybe tingling or heaviness. Maybe areas of warmth. So much of our communication with the world is happening through our face, receiving through the eyes, extending with our words, and expressing through these 42 muscle groups, our feelings, or holding them back with those same muscles.
many of us identify so much with our face, this very personal aspect of our being. So it takes some moments to soften or loosen that sense of my face. And simply feel face as this collection of sensations. Inviting a softening with the exhales at the forehead and through the eyes. Softening through the cheekbones and the jaw. And let's continue to settle, notice these sensations throughout the body. With that gentle curiosity, noticing the sensations just as they are. Noticing the body from within the body. Of course, the mind will wander, no problem. Keep relaxing and releasing and returning to settling the body in a natural state. Feel or imagine the quality of stability, of stillness, of presence throughout the body. These qualities like the mountain.
And to support us in settling our inner speech, that narration and dialogue that will inevitably keep coming. We give ourselves the anchor of the breath, noticing the breath as the belly rises, noticing the breath as the belly once again returns to its natural state, released. So slightly narrowing the focus from the entire body to the breath at the abdomen with the intention to start settling this inner dialogue and speech as though turning the volume down. with our body and speech starting to settle. We can invite our mind as well. to come into its natural qualities, a vividness, a clarity. Checking in that the muscles in the face are still relaxed and inviting that softening, that pliancy through the body. This will support our mind too in relaxing, opening. Creating more space around the thoughts, memories, images, and ideas which can freely come and go. And let's take a moment here to connect with an intention for this practice, for our time together. Our intention is our guiding light, reminding us what matters to us. 
It can be so simple. It can be a simple word, kindness, openness, healing. It can be a phrase, something we want to bear in mind as the purpose of our practice time. To find peace of mind, to feel connected. So consider an intention that really meets you, meets what you've noticed in your body, speech and mind. You can imagine this intention like a gift, a gift for yourself and to all the ways you will engage this intention through others in the world. And remembering that any intention can help us arouse our bodhicitta, remind us of this goal to be of service, to transform this body, mind, and heart as a vessel and vehicle for awakening for ourselves and all beings. That can sound intimidating. but it gives us the dignity to persevere through the practice, which sometimes can be enjoyable and often can be challenging. Invite your intention to gently Settle into the background. And we'll come back to a gentle focus on the body. Before we move into a practice, really inviting a more spacious awareness. We'll take a moment here to be with whatever is in the body that might need some attention. Our body, we hold here the residue of our emotions, our stress. Without an agenda, let's simply open up space for the sensations in the body associated with emotional residue from the day, maybe from the week or this lifetime. So dropping anything other than a desire to make space around felt sensations in the body, especially those that may relate to feelings of difficulty, maybe conflict with someone we are close to, maybe disappointment or loss. Giving ourselves a moment here to just connect and open up make space with what's here in the body right now.
simply our kind attention can help unwind and loosen some of the tightness around our emotional experiences in the body. Making space can mean moving our experience from the relative, the personal, to the ultimate and expansiveness around our day-to-day -day emotional content. And as we shift to this practice of settling the mind in its natural state, in which we observe thoughts, memories, and images as they arrive, observe them in their wave-like nature, arising and cresting and returning from where they came, can be helpful to have the eyes slightly open, allowing in some clarity, But let the gaze be softly focused. In this practice, we rely on that relaxed, pliant body to invite our mind also to relax with clarity. To settle the mind is to allow the thoughts and memories and images to come and go freely. Instead of being caught in our thoughts, it's as though we're leaning back into our awareness. Maybe the thoughts feel very busy, a constant flow. No problem, keep relaxing, leaning back. Maybe there's a feeling of spaced out or dull, not a problem. Lean back, but invite that sense of clarity. You may notice that some thoughts are fast and bright. 
Others are stickier, slower. Without engaging in the content of thoughts, be curious about the form of thoughts, memories, images. Some have words, narratives. Some may just be colors, shapes, images. We balance this clarity and relaxation, this ease and vividness by resting in awareness and focusing on the thoughts, memories, and images as they arise and fall. And you notice, when awareness notices that you've been caught up in a thought or a story, fantasy, relax and release and just return, refreshing your interest for just a bit longer. Even noticing one thought without getting caught up in it is a taste of true freedom, liberation. No need to be judgmental of the thoughts or the contents of the mind whatsoever. Just keep leaning back and finding the spaciousness of awareness in which anything can arise. And just like a firework, illuminate the space of our mind and disappear.
If your eyes have been open, gently close them and regather your attention and awareness to the body. As though pouring all of your attention into the space of the body. Taking a moment to feel the preciousness of this human body. Once again, connecting to the breath at the belly. In a moment, I'll ring the bell. And I invite you to consider how much of this present experience can you bring forward into our group time and space together, bridging the meditation and post-meditation, the sense of embodiment and presence whatever you've been able to touch over the course of this practice. Thank you for your practice. It's always such a treat to teach coming off of retreat myself. I uh, feel the gratitude of receiving teachings and then being able to share them with you all. Any reflections or questions on practice? You can raise your hand or put them in chat. We did a bit of a medley there. The goal was settling the mind in its natural state as as we often practice together. Um, But I gave us a little time to ramp up, to be with the body and to be with maybe the material, especially emotionally in the body. Yeah, I would love to hear from folks. Um, Any questions or even reflections on that? Moving from that embodied presence, working with the emotional material to that more spacious state of mind.
Claudia. Steve, um, settling the body felt wonderful. Really relaxed because was able to send some sensations and soreness. And, but lately, I've been having a real hard time settling my mind, like thoughts keep on coming, you know, and I try to come back to the breath and pretty soon it's again. So any suggestions? Yeah. Are, what are they like, the thoughts? Not the content, but are they fast or are they like, how, how are they? Well, usually like to do either for, you know, future or past yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. really being, uh, having a hard time staying in the present and really just, just being present. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, there's so many amazing techniques that people try and maybe one of them will work. Uh, but a, a couple ideas um, that, that I have found useful actually when, especially when the mind feels especially active it could be so many reasons it could be our diet it could be you know what's going on in our life it could be just other um, states internally that are shifting and moving um, when I'm finding it really difficult to not um, get caught up in thought I'll actually do a sitting practice and a walking practice together meaning I will just walk here for five minutes and sit for five minutes and then walk for five minutes and then sit for five minutes. And just that kind of that slight difference. And I think of course, for many of us um, in the body, uh, it can really, it can help us focus, especially if we're doing walking practice. So that when we sit, there's a little bit of that kind of momentum of having the body in the mind, having the mind in the body. <laughs> Um, and I, so I think that's one nice way to do it. And another with both the walking and the sitting, has you, have you ever done counting Claudia? Have you ever kind of really done that practice? Sometimes. Yes. It's really useful. It, it seems like, you know, kindergarten or something like it's so basic, but it's really useful practice and it can really help us um, again, kind of get the mind into the groove of being in one place. It's, it's a, you know, I think for some of us um, at certain times, it, it's just a habit. Maybe our whole day is filled with thinking in a certain way and just really hard to get out of that. Um, counting, especially if we're really specific on the counting, you know, like only at the top of the inhale. Some people like it at the top of the, or bottom of the exhale, but, one, you know, just one. And just going to 10, really hard to get to 10, probably have to start over. But it's, it is a way to kind of, um, you know, Shanti Deva uses that beautiful um, illustration of kind of mindfulness being like a rope around the wild elephant of your mind. So it's, it's a good rope, the counting kind of kind of helps tether in a bit. So yeah, Try, try either of those and let me know how that goes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Leanne, I see your hand raised. Yes, I'm in the dark, <laughs> um, which I don't mind. Um, I'd like to share an insight if I can that came sure. to me during the practice. Um, this is gonna sound like, um, well, just stay with me, it's relevant. <laughs> so I, um, I just very recently started sort of seeing someone and um, it's like very, very, very new. And so I'm very aware of, how, and it's like, like very new, you know? And so it's, I'm like aware of all of the, being flooded with all of these, what endorphin sensation, whatever. And of course I'm also, do you have baggage and pain? So really negotiating, like, let's not feel that, you know, let's like, just sort of shut it down. Let's just stay cool. And I realized during practice that like, at this stage, it's really not about this person. It's, it's that they're, there's suddenly an object for love and affection. And that that's, and I sort of had that insight and thought, oh, well, if that's, 
what I really want to feel like that's what a meta practice is and that I don't need to be forcing it on a person and you know it's it can also go organically and, and may develop but that yeah like really kind of leaning into that universality and um mm. and that that's something that's available when there is or is not a, a person to go in to receive it and so it just gave me a really um personal and like connection I guess to the meta practice and like a reframing that then also gave me permission to like allow those sensations which are what we should really be allowing <laughs> you know like that's why it's a whole practice so um I just uh yeah wanted to share that that's beautiful yeah I, I uh I feel a great deal of empathetic joy just hearing that honestly it's just it's lovely to have that insight in the in the yeah I, I was I was really um remembering and recalling exactly the feelings you're describing of that um, anticipation, excitement, anxiety, dread, <laughs> re-traumatizing. <Yeah, yeah>, suffering. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Of yeah, of um, you know, of of um enjoying an experience with someone. It's it's of course um such an amazing and, and potent portal that kind of relational energy that we get to tap into and all the stuff it brings up and all the hurt and all the hope. And it is truly the mind of hope and fear, like just yeah. on the most repeat cycle that um, we maybe ever get to feel it, just seeing it so clearly. And to be able to um, transfer that to a more universal sense of, of love is, is, is lovely, right? We, could, we can do the same for grief, right? When we lose someone, we can feel the, the, the pain and the, um, just the kind of exquisite sadness and sorrow of it for ourselves. And it can be a portal to the, the universal feeling of, of loss, really opening us up to compassion. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. I'm also glad to have tools to deal with suffering because it's very anxiety inducing. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Anyone else before we move on to our, yes, David. Um, I, I really enjoyed the, uh, um, oh, hold, let me pin you. Uh, I really enjoyed the um, resting in the nature of mind part. Uh, and I had heard of that, you know, been introduced to that practice through teachings of Alan Wallace. Um, and now that was the first time in years I had given it a try. Mm. And, um, uh, um, it was much more enjoyable this time. <laughs> <laughs> and I think partly it was that he tended to just give you the practice and then say, now we're going to do that for 20 minutes. And I really appreciated your um, stepping in kind of and helping us well all along through the practice but in that part particularly mm. and it was also really nice to give my mind permission to do what it does instead of always I have this habit a kind of a bad habit of the mind moves or it thinks or and then some other part of my mind like the the rule keeper gets upset you know and so it was nice to just uh, be more out on, you know, in the sandbox together. So mm. I appreciated that part of it. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, of course, yeah, we share Alan as a, as a, a source of great teaching. And um, I also love this practice and, and, you know, I, I find it can be really hard to get into if, if there's just even like baseline emotional content, like I didn't have a particularly dramatic day, but there was a lot of stuff. And when we sit down to practice, if we haven't sat since the morning, like for me, I haven't sat since the morning, there's kind of a lot of buildup. And to try to just go into the space of the mind, wow, it's, um, it's really challenging without uh, kind of befriending. It's almost, it feels like a kind of a, you know, 
little offering to the inner emotional world before we go into this more vast space. I, I see you. I recognize you. We're together. And, you know, I do think that there's there's truly not a problem with the contents of our mind and um, in, in terms of doing this practice well. And even if that is said to us at the very beginning, I think we need to hear it quite a lot. Not a problem. Content of your mind is not a problem. And, and it was, um, I got to sit this last weekend with two really beautiful teachers, uh, Stephen Smith and Michelle McDonald. Some of you may be familiar with them, Vipassana teachers. Um, and they really emphasize this idea of the kind of co-arising of our mundane everyday mind and our more clear, lucid, um, enlightened, we could say, process of mind. They don't need to be separate. Found that really encouraging. Um, yeah. Okay, so we are on chapter five, which is giving up the causes of suffering. Just, I love it. I wish I could just be like that. Like, yep, we all give it up tonight. Um, yeah, there's a couple really beautiful lines, especially in how Matthew opens up. He says, um, someone who renounces the world to escape from the prison of illusion is like a bird escaping from its cage to fly into the sky. It does not matter whether the cage is made of gold or base metal, it is still a prison. This idea that whether individuals are rich or poor, famous or unknown, whether they experience success or failure, pleasure or pain, they end up unhappy and frustrated. So this idea of giving up the causes of suffering uh, and that as really being in some ways synonymous or with renunciation, it's a little, um, I'd say it's a little challenging for many of us who grew up in a material, materialist world where we really do believe that getting new nice things will make us happy. And whether that's status or whether that's actual objects. And that, you know, this, this clear teaching for thousands of years that actually, wow, it's our wanting of those things, not those things themselves. There's nothing wrong with nice things but our wanting of them, that's the prison. And that makes us so unhappy. He says, renunciation does not mean depriving oneself of what is truly good and useful in life, but rather getting rid of unnecessary burdens. When the hermit repeats 10 times the magic mantra, I need nothing. They are not making their life insipid, but trying to get rid of endless distractions that take over the mind and leave them with the bitter taste of lost time. So I was kind of foreshadowing that in this chapter, there's a couple of these longer poems. And these are poems of the hermit. So kind of folks who are really trying to unclutter their life, to take this idea of renunciation very seriously and um, kind of remove from the everyday mundane realities and dedicate truly to the Dharma. I, I will say that, um, My, my ability to um, connect with these teachings is not at the level of hermit. I really relate to these teachings as what is the point of my day or my week or maybe my year where I'm engaging more like a hermit and then where I'm really of the world and for the world. I, I, think, it's, I think it's important and essential for those of us who feel that we are being asked by the world to show up in the ways that we're showing up, whether that's as a parent or a friend or in our work context. Um, hermit is not the ultimate ideal for everyone. I was really heartened actually to hear Alan Wallace talk about that once with a very dedicated student who was asking him in a very heartfelt way, I think I feel called to monastic life. And yet I have this home, I have this family, I have these obligations. And to really talk through that beautiful desire to dedicate oneself to the Dharma, and it need not be to become a hermit to do so, right? There are these ways that we can adopt these ideas and views, really adhere to them to great benefit 
without this idea that, God, I need to get rid of everything and go away. It's interesting because, because we can, you know, kind of now in this remote world, we can kind of go away from, <laughs> from, you know, maybe more dense urban living environments. Um, and yet, for many of us, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily relieve us of responsibilities um, or release, relieve us of these mindsets. Um, when we think of renunciation, you know, I, I think of being able to experience awareness as your true refuge. Like, oh gosh, I know where I'm at home. I know what is the deepest feeling of peace, it's awareness. Like that to me is a, is a kind of um, almost a natural renunciation when we find that sense of peace in our own mind. Um, so there's a, a passage here by uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the current one, the 14th. He says, being less concerned about the affairs of this life means assuming its ups and downs with a broad and stable mind. I really liked that idea that it's not getting rid of, again, ups and downs. It's not necessarily going to that hermit cave, but to have a broad and stable mind. When something is broad and stable, it can really withstand a lot of the ups and downs. And it's interesting because, you know, we think of stability, uh, we think of spacious awareness, but for some reason for me, it brings to mind like, you know, a stand-up paddleboard, like a very wide surface on the water. If you have a very narrow surface on the water, almost anything can tip it over. It's really easy. But the wider you have of this board, the easier it is to have that balance on it. Um, so I, I appreciated that instruction or that kind of image. There's a, another part here by Dougal Kensei Rinpoche. Uh, which I, I think is quite lovely, um, really reminding us that no one is ever satisfied with their wealth or power. That would be too easy. Although the modern world has reached an unimaginable level of development in science and technology, there is no machine and no trick to end suffering and produce happiness. We must first realize the true cause of suffering is not outside, but inside. We suffer because of all sorts of negative emotions, such as attachment, anger, repulsion, pride, jealousy, confusion. Those emotions are real mental poisons and based in a wrong way of understanding and lead only to suffering. This is why the true spiritual practice consists of working with one's own mind. So there's a, a couple points here. <laughs> it's really interesting because they're pointing out essentially partially this hedonic treadmill. So some of you may be familiar with this term that is used in contemporary psychological research of happiness. And the reason that we do have this sense of um, <laughs> uh, kind of dissatisfaction kind of at baseline is that we adapt to what we like very quickly. So for example, uh, what do I have here? I have, have this nice crystal, it's really beautiful. It's kind of jade and amethyst. And you know, when this crystal first came into my life, I probably noticed it a lot more. Just so beautiful, my gosh. And you know, when, it, when I first um, purchased it, it was just, oh, wow. I wanna put this on my altar. It's gonna be such a beautiful thing. Days, weeks, months later, it just fades into the background, right? We just adapt so quickly to that, which is a pleasure from the outside. And it's, it's a really interesting kind of facet of our human mind that not only do we adapt to things quickly, but we really want more. <laughs> like we really, there's a, there's a seeking, right? We have this kind of hedonic pull towards that which feels good through our sensory um, experiences, that which tastes good, that which feels good, that which looks good, that which sounds good. But we so quickly kind of adapt to it and then want something different. So that's that treadmill experience. And uh, it describes here, right? That there is 
no machine, no trick to end suffering and produce happiness. It's kind of incredible, right? All of our innovations, however many stories high the Salesforce building is, right? Really impressive feat of architecture, but we actually don't have a way to make people happy through a machine, through a product. It is still an inside job. And that's so humbling, um, such an interesting um, aspect of this human life that if it certainly was that we just reached some level of material attainment and were happy, it'd be a very different world that we lived in. And it may seem that way at times, but of course uh, it is, it's not true. Um, and pointing out here this idea that the suffering, you know, is our own suffering. The suffering is our internal experience of our emotions. And as many of you know, I, I really feel so, so um, passionate about working with our emotions on the, on the path of the Dharma, how important it is that we really um, understand, develop awareness and try to transform our difficult emotions. The emotions that are described here really, you know, attachment, anger, repulsion, pride, jealousy, and confusion. These are almost kind of habits, not just something we feel one day as a result of an experience, but a way that we are interacting with the world. So some teachers say that we, all of us have a certain type, like, oh, I'm an attached type or I'm an aversive type, right? Um, so some of these may be stronger for some of us than others. This idea of just wanting to get away from things, jealousy, right? That so well facilitated by contemporary social media and seeing others and confusion, just not knowing. And I think this idea that, you know, our, our entire practice is working with our own mind, just really um, so simple and yet, um, that is the essence of this renunciation, giving up all these other ways and hopes, all these other tools and strategies that we think are gonna bring us to that sense of, of freedom and of happiness. The last part of that passage is through meditating over and over again on the nature of mind, one can gradually dissolve ego clinging. Among all the methods to achieve that result, the most profound is the meditation on bodhicitta, love and compassion, to be full of love for all sentient beings and consider others more important than oneself is the very root of the Dharma. So just really beautiful connection here that as we're working with our mind, practices to of course, um, find that spaciousness we're exploring in the meditation and that another way to just naturally open our mind, start to liberate ourselves from these encumbered, so you could almost say self-imposed suffering of our difficult emotions is our just true love for others. And not that uh, avoiding our own difficulty by caring for others too much love, but a real heartfelt aspiration to care for others. That that is a, such a deep well and source of our, of our happiness. And if we are renouncing something we are then making space for something else to be more present and making more space to be more present with that, that natural beauty, that kind of compassion, which is always there, uh, that we don't really need to um, fabricate in any way. There's another beautiful um, quote here by Shakbar. It says, how does ignorance manifest? If one night you pass by a coiled rope on the ground in the dark, you might think it is a snake curled up and be so terrified your heart races. Similarly, when we are immersed in dark, the darkness of ignorance, we have a mistaken perception of the temporary meeting of our body and consciousness. Unable to clearly discern its true nature, we take it as an eye. That eye, in fact, has no reality. And then we create a distinction between I and others. We are attached to one and reject the others. Based on this double process of attraction and repulsion, 
all other mental poisons arise. And under their influence, we take birth in the various higher and lower worlds of samsara, which we do a mixture of beneficial and harmful deeds with unfortunate consequences. So this real kind of simple distillation that the essence of so much of our suffering is this wrong seeing, this inaccurate view of being a self. I understand it better in, in the words of, um, of my teacher, Jennifer Wellwood. She, she talks about it as uh, our kind of obsession with the identity project. So not just, um, not this, this idea of, you know, um, thinking that I am a solid self, that that one, I find at times can be hard to understand when every day I have to wake up and be Eve and respond to my name and do my work in the world and remember who I am and what I need to do. So when I think about this identity project of Eve and kind of how, what it takes to maintain that, kind of perpetuating it and sustaining it and protecting it, that I can see creates a lot of suffering. That I can see creates a lot of just like kind of fabricated sense of um, value and importance. So a lot of this chapter on renunciation brings us back to this very same kind of core of how do we loosen a bit of these kind of strong holding ties that we have to our sense of self, to our identity project. If we do so, it's it's almost like this um, this key that can unlock various levels all at once. And what's so interesting about this identity project, you know, the term ego dissolution is used, and an ego dissolution is is <laughs> it's quite a strong experience, not necessarily one that we could per se sustain on a daily basis with one another but we can touch that experience in meditation and bring that insight into our everyday life. So some of the ways that we start to work with loosening this such strong sense of I and me and my and mine that causes so much pain that creates that separation is being able to, in our meditation, start to just very gently touch into a sense of that less identified self more spacious self. So I find this to be a pretty hard concept and idea. And I'd be curious from folks if there's, there's questions or reflections on this kind of fundamental quality needed for renunciation of loosening a sense of I, of me and mine. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, one thing that came to mind as you were talking about that like identity project, um, I thought about like a company and like branding and it like struck me, I'm like that identity project is kind of like, am I like maintaining my brand? You know, it's like, how do I look to other people? Like, you know, it comes up for me a lot at work. It's like, I want to be seen as competent and I want to be in the room where decisions are being made. You know, there's a lot of that that comes up for me there. Um, and so it's like, when you were talking about like still needing to like show up as ourselves each day, it's like, am I doing that? And then also like carrying this burden of like maintaining my brand while I'm doing it all? Or am I just doing it? Am I just cleaning my room because it needs to be clean, you know? like. Mm. Um, yeah, it just feels like a big kind of like rock to carry along with just living my life. Yeah, yeah, I, I really resonate with that um, experience in, in, in like professional realms of wanting to be seen, wanting to be good, wanting to be, you know, um, and it, it creates this um, kind of need for strategy almost and positioning and like that you know, like here I am and here they are, and where am I? And I think it's, I mean, maybe needless to say, it's fine, right? I think, again, a lot of this is around, um, a lot of this invitation to renunciation isn't 
stop going to work and stop caring what people think. It's um, how can we hold it? You know, we, if we hold it like with that tight fist, if it creates worry and rumination that wakes us up at night, if it makes us, you know, kind of perpetually seeking these sources of relief that won't help us, that's a problem, right? But if we come down after our day at work and seek that inner refuge and look for awareness as a refuge, I think that that um, it will naturally kind of undo a bit of the working of that identity project. And then of course, you know, in-depth psychotherapy, you know, never hurts, right? But when we talk about the Dharma and, you know, like at least loosening um, this, and, and I, it's interesting because I think there's a direct relationship to this desire to be um, kind of engaged in the world. And so then we are, all of our, our attention goes up and out and then we're seeking a kind of reward from the world too. And we forget to seek that reward internally. So it's, it can be very hard to kind of live in both worlds. This world where we really feel filled uh, with this sense of um, intrinsic joy. And then where we're also wanting to engage with the rewards of kind of material relative reality because they are real too. And I think it is, it's a, it's an interesting and, and difficult position, you know, being a practitioner in the world and, and really holding these ideas close. Yeah. Do you have any, any ways that you kind of um, reconnect or refill after a day that feels kind of pulling you away? Yeah. Um... I mean, I, I guess I kind of struggle with that sometimes, but definitely for me, kind of like running energy, like exercise or going out for a walk, even just like yeah, feeling fresh air on my skin after being inside all day, yeah. you know, like that'll all kind of really pull me out. Yeah, definitely. beautiful. Yeah, and I think, right, you know, um, happily, we, we get to live in these human bodies and they are such a great resource to us. And, and especially, you know, if we can tune, tune in to that subtle body experience where we can sense the, um, it, it doesn't have to be verbal. It doesn't have to be, wow, I had this difficult experience with this person. Just like, oh, there's like that layer of ache right here, or there's that tightness there. And we know it to be not just physical pain, not just muscle pain but we know that the imprint of our emotions are, is in our body, living in our body. And we can be gentle with that, but attuned to it. So as we're moving with our body through the world, I, I, I'm a huge proponent of exercise. I love it. I'm a big fan. It's, I can't imagine I would have any sort of mental health without it. And I think sometimes it can also separate us from our deeper being. Um, it can kind of um, pull us into something outward. So it's, it's nice to have a, a combination of bodily practices that really help cultivate, you know, those inner states and then the body practices that help us release energy too. Thank you. I see a question here from uh, Heidi. Is equanimity an important concept in this? Equanimity is an important concept in everything. Um, and yeah, you know, I think it's interesting, you know, with renunciation and this idea of kind of giving up the causes of suffering, it's, it's both part of how we are able to identify what will support us and also part of the fruition to feel equanimity is to really have this sense of, of clear seeing of impartiality, being able to love all without a desire for, you know, return or some sort of um, reciprocity. So I think to have that equanimity of, um, you know, really being able to love love um, fully and also have that sense of not getting dragged down and pulled in to this personal material, um, it's essential. But it's an interesting question, like, can equi will equanimity help us with this 
softening of I, me, and mine. It, absolutely, yeah. This sense of um, interconnection, I would say, interdependence as well. You know, I think, again, such a big concept, this idea of trying to unhook ourselves from a fixed identity. It can be really helpful to just have that sense of communal, collect collective presence and care, this interdependence. When we feel really separate, when we feel really alone, it's just so much harder to be in this world. When we have a sense of like shared collective um, presence, it's much easier, but it's it's not quite kind of giving up um, the sense of fixed eye because we could even start to reify or make fixed this idea of being in community. The whole idea is the kind of fluctuation, the impermanence, the coming and going. It's really, um, it's really humbling as uh, <clears throat> you know, all of us on this call are aging, different states, different phases, but it's just this incredible, um, often daily, but certainly yearly reminder of the constant changes. And one I think and hope can help us a little loosen that sense of I and me and my, as we are changing and shifting. Okay, I see from Leanne, this is helpful as I applied for a job and I'm attending a conference that the person hiring this weekend, how to say standard and authentic without getting caught up in strategy. Yes. Um, again, you know, in relative reality, when applying for a job and needing a job, it's okay if we act fake and are too nice and are not authentic temporarily. That doesn't, doesn't go outside our dharma, right? We, you know, we have to, as it said, cut wood and carry water in order for us to sustain our practice, especially in, in the modern day world, there are things we need to do. Um, I do think remembering, you know, this sense of, of connection that we have with others is a great way to feel a lot of intrinsic joy and happiness and, and make that experience also present for others. So if you're wanting, as the Dalai Lama says, if you wanna be happy, practice compassion. And if you want other people to be happy, practice compassion. That will both work. Um, and Walt says here, um, is renunciation a never completed process in the way that a former addict has to at least periodically recall how things were? Because craving is such a strong pull. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I just, I think about that. Um, yeah, I think it, it's so interesting thinking of renunciation in 2021 in the Bay Area and, and, and beyond. And just, you know, this, we live in a world where there's so much access to material goods. And whether you have a little or a lot, you can kind of buy a lot of things. It's unprecedented. Sokni Rinpoche, um, I'm sure I've shared this before, but he is fond of saying that in kind of contemporary modern culture, samsara almost works. Like we can almost fulfill desires incessantly and feel satisfied. But then there's like that edge of where our desires are unfulfilled and we get a taste of unsatisfactoriness, but it's really hard to keep ourselves in this mindset of the joy and peace I am seeking is within when we can so easily kind of fill from without, like what's the next thing we're gonna binge watch? What's the next uh, thing we're going, you know, next new sweatshirt or crystal that we're gonna buy and feel better and just kind of keep pumping up that next um, enjoyable sensory experience. It's just, it's, it's incredible how much we can do it. And of course we see the cost and consequence of it at our global climate level. But it is something that um, I think more than in, in previous generations, we, samsara almost works, right? It, it's almost, we can almost keep ourselves fully occupied and almost feel satisfied with just trying to maintain our material well-being. 
and reaching better and better forms of it. So yeah, I love that, um, that insight. Uh, another great way as, uh, as we have actually, we've, we've played upon quite a lot here in this Sangha over the last months of um, another great way to, to help guide us towards the renunciation uh, as shared by Dringung Jingten Gompo. When we look at death and the impermanence of all things, our ordinary projects are just a joke. How can you believe in the eight worldly preoccupations which are as transient as the colors of the rainbow? So there's, you know, and, um, Eight worldly concerns are happiness, sad, happiness and sadness, gain and loss, fame and ill repute. Um, uh, so yeah, I think it's uh, it's it is always useful to just remember impermanence um, over and over and have that have that as an instructor for us. I'm going to share just a couple lines of one of these poems um, that was again, kind of inspired as a way to help uh, facilitate renunciation. I will say that these poems are, are very like self-critical uh, in a way that is, doesn't feel that, um, that relevant to how I might like to proclaim my renunciation. So quite a lot of negativity, <laughs> not that encouraging. Um, and yet, um, so this is from, uh, Pema Lingpa, and he's, he starts off this great poem. You were born in the mire of samsara, your homeland. Until the age of nine, your parents take care of you, and you wandered in human society. And though no one taught you, you were pretty good. Now you're just a common slave, a peddler of the sacred. Although you are a holder of the word of Udiana, you are distracted by the lures of attachment and aversion. Abandon those illusions, Pema Lingpa. You haven't given up the desire for food and wealth. You're caught in the snare of greed and self-attachment, obsessed with your ego, consumed with desire. You fool yourself. So um, quite a lot of this kind of, you know, confession in a way, trying to encourage him. But then there is some, you know, very beautiful ways of understanding our relationship to attachment to the world. Um, so he says, your homeland is the prison of Mara, the instigator of obstacles. Friends and relatives are Mara's tempters. Food and riches are Mara's brigands. Samsara is the stake he will tie you to. Mara's rope is your laziness. Mara comes from your attachment to self. You don't know your own nature and never cease to procrastinate. Abandon the eight worldly concerns, Pema Lingpa. So uh, yeah, I'm not sure if this would inspire me to write a, a poem about uh, how lazy and bad of a practitioner I was. Um, and yet, uh, I think some of the insights are quite helpful. Oh, Kieran, I see your hand. Yeah, who wrote that? Oh, sorry. Pema Lingpa. Yeah, they have a good sense of humor. You, there's actually one in there about he calls himself a llama draped in the robes, and it looks like a turd wrapped in fabric. Um, yep, sounds good. <laughs> <a lot. laughs> yeah, he's uh, he's there's a colorful character in there, but um, yeah. So I think you know, especially in terms of renunciation, uh, I, I said this at the very beginning, but the best form is the form that comes naturally when there's a desire and, and, you know, just either a sense of, I'm just so done with buying stuff. It doesn't make me happy or gosh, I'm just so held by my meditation practice. So letting renunciation feel natural, not forced, not like, God, I really got to, I really got to effort my way through this one. Um, but maybe noticing where, there is that tiring of our sense of self, of our identity project, of that cycle of samsara of just grabbing and grabbing. So look for those glimpses of just that natural liberation, that natural sense of wanting to dedicate oneself more and more to the Dharma as we are here together. 
So let's take a moment to dedicate the merit of our practice. So coming into some posture where you can connect inward once again. And checking in with the body. And checking in with the heart and the mind. And considering the possibility that something in this body, heart, and mind has been transformed or worked with this evening. And if there's been any benefit in that working and that transformation, let's consider it an offering. It represents our desire to be of service and our desire to work towards the possibility that all beings could know safety, all beings could know peace, all beings could experience the true causes of happiness, and all beings could be free. Great to be with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Eve. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Till next week. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Bye.